Um, I do apologise about the confusion this morning. I seem to have um, uh, managed to hugely confuse people. I've, there were two different times. There was a different time on the registration um, page and on the um, and on the timetable. Um, and I decided, rightly or wrongly, to go with the time on the timetable when I spotted it this morning. Um, so sorry about that. The only the other thing. Um, that we might struggle with a little bit today is that um, uh, I'm um, delivering this on a on a laptop because I've got a problem with my um, uh, desk desktop computer, but it, it seems to be working okay. I, uh, there's nobody that can't see the slides. I take it. No, good. Okay. Um, it, but it means that I'm going to keep um, getting out of uh, presentation view on PowerPoint. Um, we're just going to wait for five more minutes while people are still joining us. Um, anyone that misses this, I think what I'll do, because I've created confusion, is I will um, deliver it again at a later date when people can uh, be sure of being able to log on. Um, the other thing is that you've got another webinar straight after this one. I will finish in time for you to uh, be able to get onto your your biology webinar. I'm just getting the. Um, So now I assume that everybody can see the screen. Can some people come back to me confirming that they can see the screen? I think there might be a problem with this because uh, nobody seems to be coming back to me about uh, being able to view what's happening. Um, can, 
Can people confirm that they can um, hear me and see the screen? Ah, right, okay. Now it's working. Right. Let's, um, let's begin this webinar then. Um, dear, oh dear. Can I ask also, are you um, seeing the control panels? Or can you just clearly see the slides? Okay, I'm going to assume that you can you can see everything okay then. It seems like uh, people can. Right, the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, um, informed consent as controlled by the uh, Mental Capacity Act. Um, informed consent was uh, defined by the Law Society as... Um, an individual always being presumed to be competent or to have mental capacity to enter into a particular transaction until proved otherwise. Um, now, for us as nurses, the most important thing about that is that no one can consent to or refuse treatment on behalf of another adult who lacks the capacity to consent. And um, an important instance of this is that parents cannot consent on behalf of their children, no matter what their level of say a learning disability is. Um, consent then can only be waived under certain conditions and that's when we seek to preserve someone's life, their health or their well-being, for instance in um, accident and emergency or in emergency situations. Um, also if the patient's being held under the Mental Health Act. Uh, the formal procedure for this to happen is that the best interest meeting, which is a multidisciplinary meeting, uh, takes place, including all professionals, carers, and uh, family of the patient involved. Um, at the meeting, professionals decide whether a particular intervention um, is in accordance with best practice. That means um, it uh, is evidence-based and it genuinely is the best thing for uh, for the individual concerned at that time. Um, any intervention that's carried out without the individual's consent and without a best practice meeting being held under the Mental Capacity Act constitutes a civil or criminal assault, even if it was intended to benefit the patient. The test that's used to determine someone's capacity to consent is that um, they can grasp what will happen to them and why it's necessary, as long as that's given in very simple terms, and that the benefits and risks of the treatment and what alternatives are available are also understood, and what is likely to happen if the patient doesn't consent. Um, other important factors in establishing whether or not somebody has the capacity to consent um, are that they must be able to retain um, what's been discussed with them. Um, but we have to be aware um, during this process that people mustn't be coerced into making decisions because um, the people that are supposed to be acting in their best act uh, interest strongly believe that the patient should have the treatment. So ma no matter how strongly you think that somebody should accept a treatment, or we as health workers think that somebody should accept a treatment, if they have the capacity to consent and they don't want that treatment, then they have the right to refuse it. Capacity can be transitory. Um, this is particularly important in terms of people's mental health. They might move in and out over um, a period of time 
um, of having the capacity to consent to treatment. For instance, temporary uh, factors such as psychosis, shock, depression, um, taking illegal drugs or being under the influence of alcohol can affect capacity as clearly can permanent factors like learning disability, um, cognitive impairment, things like vascular dementia or other forms of dementia, Parkinson's disease, brain injury, all of these things can affect capacity. I'm just going to move the question panel to where I can see it. So people are asking me questions about forcing treatment. Um, if someone doesn't have capacity, then they can be made to, to, to have a treatment, but only if that treatment is absolutely necessary and based on current evidence. So it's only if they're going to come to significant harm if they don't have the treatment. Uh, and somebody should be reassessed for every new treatment. Um, so the answer is yes to that, that, that question. Oops, zero dear, I'm getting a pickle with this. Um, in order to assess how capacity, um, to assess capacity, um, we have to find out what skills or knowledge the patient may require to exercise capacity, what support and information they require to achieve capacity. Um, and this is it's really important to involve somebody who really knows the patient well when that assessment's taking place. Um, Capacity should also be reviewed on a daily basis, and it's likely that most qualified nurses will be involved in this sort of process because it will be part of a daily care plan. The concept of best interests is another thing that we need to consider quite carefully. Some people will never be able to make health decisions for themselves. Um, our laws say that um, if you're not able to make health decisions, then you can receive treatment that's common practice if it's used by an appropriately trained medical practitioner and if it genuinely is in your best interest. The final responsibility for any treatment plan for the patient lies with health professionals, doctors, nurses and physiotherapists and so on. That doesn't mean we shouldn't consult with people and give them as much choice as we possibly can. Even if they've had um, the capacity to make decisions taken away from them. We should also consult with people close to the patient to gain agreement. There are some caveats to that though. There are circumstances when um, there are good reasons why people close to the patient shouldn't be consulted. Um, either because the situation is too urgent or because um, the patient's wish, um, possibly made when they had capacity, um, their beliefs and general well-being um, precludes that or where there's um, conflict um, related to uh, consulting with people close to the patient. Um, Sometimes those decisions um, have to be made via court in order to protect the individual. So let me pose this um, little scenario to you. Um, a wife is in a care home with dementia. Her husband comes calling on, a sat on Saturday afternoons, closes the door, Staff are reasonably sure that um, this couple are having sex and as far as they can tell the wife enjoys it but they could see they, they can see that she has no real understanding of the uh, sexual nature of the husband's behavior what, what do you think about that in terms of consent um, can the wife consent to that uh, taking place 
or is that something that we should be protecting her from? So people are coming back to me now and they're saying that um, in this situation the wife should be protected. Others feel that, no, that that's not the case. Um, some people are confused about whether or not she really is um, at risk of harm. Um, and others pointing out that this is a very difficult situation, a hard decision to make. Um, I'll just let a few more questions build up. It looks like the majority are saying that, 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 that in this case, the man's wife would need to be protected. Because she can't content, consent to um, having sex with her husband. Um, well, um, in a real situation, um, care home practitioners and old, old age um, psychiatrists were warned that um, they could face jail sentences if they allowed patients with dementia to have sex, even with a long-term partner. Um, and this is the broader impact of the Mental Capacity Act. We talked about the use of best interest meetings for us as health professionals to um, decide whether or not somebody can consent to treatment and whether or not they would then have to have that treatment um, against their will. But the Mental Capacity Act also co covers things like sexual activity. Um, sorry, that's, that's, that's wrong. What the Mental Capacity Act does is it precludes sexual activity from the operation of the Act. So somebody cannot be coerced into um, allowing a sexual act if they don't have capacity to make a decision one way or the other. Other things that it can't be used to commit are consenting to marriage, consenting to have sex that we've already talked about, consenting to a degree, decree of divorce, consenting to um, the dissolution of an order being made in relation to a civil partnership, which is the same thing as divorce, um, a child's being placed in adoption, um, and the discharging of parental responsibility. And this is a protection for people, really. The Mental Capacity Act is quite a powerful thing um, because people can, if, if it's determined that somebody doesn't have capacity, then we can force them to do things. So these precluded um, elements are included in the Act to make sure it's not abused or used in the wrong way. Um, this area is also impacted on by the Sexual Offences Act, uh, which has a, uh, a special section on it um, for offences by carers. And it clearly states that paid carers are not permitted to have sex with people with mental disorders in their care. Um, and this includes a wide range of sexual activity. Incapacity need not be shown. This is about a breach of a position of trust. Um, and there are some exceptions to that. Um, if the person that you were caring for was your, your wife or husband and they had capacity, or you had a relationship that pre-existed the care relationship. Obviously, in these days of personalised budgets, it is possible for people in a relationship to be paid for caring for an individual. So that, those are the exceptions, but that's only where capacity exists. And this is just um, reiterating what we've already talked about, but also indicating that it is covered by the Sexual Offences Act. We've already covered that, so I'll move on to the next slide. Okay. Um, protection of vulnerable adults. 
is the next area we're going to move on to. Um, these slides are new. I'll put them onto um, the Tulip pages tomorrow. Um, but this area is quite closely related to um, the Mental Capacity Act. Uh, it's a complex area. It's something that we um, all need to be aware of. This is a very basic introduction. And I recommend that you read some of the documents attached. There's quite a long reference list at the end of this part of the presentation. Um, what I want to look at in this part of the, the lecture is the legal and policy context around this area. Signs and symptoms of um, adult abuse. What you should do um, when you, if, if, if you were in a position of having to respond or report an allegation or concern about adult abuse, um, principles of multi-agency working and the different types of adult abuse. Um, this is a different lecture to um, safeguarding children uh, lectures that you'll be attending face to face with Rachel. There is a bit of crossover, but um, uh, the two things are are quite different and you'll you'll see that when you attend the different lectures. Has anybody come across the Stephen Hoskin case? It's local, it happened in Cornwall. Some people have heard of heard of it. Um, it was quite a big headline at the time. This was a man who had um, a very severe learning disability. He had the reading ability of a six-year-old, terrified of heights. Um, his community care support was cancelled in 2005. In the aftermath of that, his bedsit became a place inhabited by local youths, um, some of whom he took on as lodgers, who abused him, basically. Um, and this sort of reached a peak when he was forced to wear a dog collar, um, crawl around the floor, he was forced to admit to criminal behaviour that he'd, he hadn't actually been involved in. Um, he was beaten uh, physically and, and uh, psychologically abused. The police, social care, health services, housing and voluntary agencies were all involved, but it didn't stop him being murdered in July of 2006. He was forced to take a, um, an overdose of paracetamol tablets and alcohol. Um, he was burned with cigarettes and made to jump from a railway viaduct, which then um, then killed him. I mean, it's a shocking example, but it shows the way in which um, a man who, with a severe learning disability, as, as I said, the reading ability of a six-year-old, well known to services, and they were involved with him, couldn't prevent um, his, uh, his death. And one of the reasons at the time that was highlighted for, for this having happened was the lack of um, multi-agency working around this man. Um, so if we're trying to gain a basic awareness of um, safeguarding vulnerable adults. These are some of the documents that we need to look at, the full references are at the end of the, uh, the presentation. Um, no Secrets, which was a document published in 2000 and was subsequently reviewed in 2009. The Mental, Mental Capacity Act, we've talked a little bit of that, about that already. The Self Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Act. Um, the update of No Secrets. The Law Commission Report and the Adult Social Care Bill. No Secrets is a key document here, really, and um, it identified uh, the need for immediate action to ensure that um, people who are at risk receive protection and support. Um, it recognised the need for an interagency framework um, for structures to be put in place so that the work, uh, uh, different agencies working together was formalised. It made it clear that the lead agency with responsibility for coordinating protection of vulnerable adults was social services, but that each agency should have a designated lead officer. So there was kind of a point of contact between all different agencies. Um, and the idea of that was to ensure that things like information sharing went on um, seamlessly 
and effectively. Um, the sorts of things that break down in these situations are um, services like um, um, housing, knowing that abuse was taking place, but not knowing what to do about it. Um, and we'll look at that in a bit more uh, detail later on. The definition that's used in No Secrets of a vulnerable adult is any adult who's vulnerable because of a mental disorder, learning difficulties, physical or sensory impairment, other impairment or older age, and who is unable to take care of him or herself or unable to protect him or herself against significant harm. Now, the housing uh, uh, um, department of the local authority knew that there were people living in, in uh, Stephen's flat um, and that, that that was not a very happy situation. It was something that um, caused him distress and uh, physical harm. But there was a, some sort of breakdown of communication that meant this was never properly reported to the other agencies involved. Abuse is defined as any violation of an individual's human and, and or civil rights by any other person or persons. Um, people are quite shocked by um, what's happening. Uh, what, what happened to Stephen. Um, someone's asked, what is No Secrets? The full reference for the No Secrets document is at the end of the presentation. Um, someone's also pointing out that, uh, which is quite right actually, that, 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 that these the people that were abusing Stephen weren't young. Um, I think I'm right in saying they were all over 18. Oops, um, I just want to go back to that last slide. Um, so the seven categories of abuse um, that are defined in uh, documents like No Secrets are discriminatory abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, psychological abuse, financial abuse, neglect and acts of omission, and institutional abuse. Now all of these um, are our business, if you like, um, and we need to have some knowledge um, regarding all of them. I, I in some ways, I, I, I want to sort of apologise for the nature of this sort of presentation because it, it, it invariably talks about some upsetting and disturbing things. But we have to um, begin at this stage in the course to get to to get get to grip, grips with this. Um, Part of um, what we need to do then is understand the processes involved uh, in an abuse situation. And in order to do this, I think we need to look at um, the reasons why abuse arise, arises. According to Ramsey and Klausnick, Oh, sorry, Ramsey Klausnick. There are five types of abusers. Overwhelmed offenders. These are people who want to, want to provide adequate care, often quite desperately, but the type of the care that that a person needs is more than they are able to give. So they're overwhelmed by the situation. You can imagine the position that many um, people caring for somebody with a, um, Alzheimer's. Um, are in. They're often elderly themselves. They're often um, suffering from health problems themselves. And um, these can lead to extremely difficult and intense situations for them at home, um, unsupported, um, possibly financially overwhelmed as well. Um, and it's that type of situation that, uh, that can lead, lead to abuse because people kind of get to the end of their capacity to deal with things. Um, uh, 
Um, just having a look at some of the questions. I will go on to talk about all the different categories of abuse in, 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 in a, a couple of slides time. Um, someone's asking what acts of omission means. I mean, that, that, that just means failing to do things that, uh, that, that, that should be done for somebody. Um, so not sometimes in some situations, not doing something is just as abusive as, um, as, as, as an actual, um, uh, act that's, that's taken against somebody. Let's have a look at some more of these um, types of abuser. Um, offenders that are impaired themselves um, because they can't care for others uh, because they themselves have dis disabilities. Um, and that's a bit like the example I gave of uh, an, uh, an elderly um, partner trying to care for somebody with, with Alzheimer's. Um, narcissistic offenders. Uh, these are people who... Um, have got a malevolent interest really there's no other way of putting it they're motivated by the personal gain what's in it for me um, way of viewing other people um, and this type of um, offender puts the um, the vulnerable adult at, at risk of neglect might, might possibly also financially exploit them um, domineering or bullying offenders um, believing that the victim deserves the abuse, uh, interpreting perhaps elements of the the victim's uh, vulnerability um, as a uh, an assault on themselves, and therefore justifying their their, their behaviour. Um, and finally, possibly most dangerous, dangerously, really, are sadistic offenders who are people that that actually. Um, enjoy the sensation of feeling powerful and humiliating and controlling others and clearly to an extent that's what happened to Stephen. Um, someone's just pointed out and James Waller just pointed out that that um, the word offender seems inappropriate for the first two points and I'd agree with you there actually. Um, we I think we should have compassion uh, towards people in, the, in those situations. I want to emphasise that often those are individuals who desperately want to give the right care and um, are just uh, uh, overwhelmed is the right word, isn't it? They um, uh, run out of the of capacity really to, to, to cope. The word offenders is only there because that's what uh, was used in the in the article itself. So let's look at the different types of abuse then. Um, discriminatory abuse is be uh, any behaviour that makes or sees a distinction to, um, between people as the basis of unfair treatment. And um, I'm sure we all know that this includes, includes racism, sexism, any discrimination on religious grounds, ageism, um, discrimination based on... Um, a person's disability and I mean, actually many other forms of harassment, slurs or similar treatment. And this really isn't an exhaustive list. I'm sure you could all add um, more things to this. Um, Oh, I'll just quickly say somebody um, had problem with audio and they were asking about what's precluded in the MCA. I, all I was pointing out there was that um, because the act's so powerful, specific preclusions were made um, to prevent people being coerced into things like marriage or sex or um, giving up their children and so on. If you go back and look at the slide, it should be made fairly clear. And also this is being recorded. So... Uh, um, you should be able to um, pick it up and go through it again. Signs and symptoms of discriminatory abuse are depression and anxiety. Um, people are ground down by this kind of um, behaviour, so they're likely to have low self-esteem and a loss of self-worth. Um, but also a failure to thrive in many areas, uh, both physical and psychological. Financial or material abuse, 
Um, this includes being pressured to lend money by relatives or friends, being charged excessive amounts for services and jobs. And we've all seen the um, news reports, I guess, of people being doorstep by tradesmen, elderly people being doorstep by tradesmen and being conned out of uh, their life savings. Um, but at a lower level than that, you know, are people frequently requesting small amounts of money from patients, um, family members moving into patients' homes without consent and without any agreement on sharing costs and so on. Um, this is a tricky one in, t in terms of uh, signs and symptoms that we might try to spot because it's often covert and very hard to, to detect. Um, you should be alert, though, to people asking patients to sign documents um, or seeking control of finances and also, obviously, of money going missing. Someone's pointing out that um, uh, ageism, the uh, type of discrimination, is quite common, and I'd certainly agree with that. Um, there is, in, in, in some ways, a, a, a sort of assumption that young lives are more valuable than older ones. Um, and uh, I think that's a fairly shocking um, concept, really. Uh, but one, I think, that operates at an almost subconscious level. Um, as I said earlier, these slides are new. They'll be on um, the Tulip page as soon as I finish this uh, pre presentation. So don't worry if you haven't seen them before. Um, it's, it's because I um, was working on them yes, yesterday. So emotional or psychological abuse. Now this is a very, very broad category. And uh, as I said earlier, this isn't an exhaustive list. I'm sure you can all add things to this. Um, but it includes things like humiliating people, um, making patients feel ashamed of their behavior um, words or actions which put people down make them feel unworthy unwanted or unimportant not respecting people's right to privacy and dignity uh, for instance opening their mail without permission leaving um, curtains open around a bed when uh, an, uh, an undignified or difficult procedures being um, carried out not knocking entering people's bedrooms without knocking um, not res uh, not respecting a patient's belongings. Uh, if a patient's uh, or, or sharing someone's belongings with other people, um, and denying patients access to children, grandchildren, partners, or other people that who are important to patients. Um, there was a recent case which I'm sure many of you have heard about at the Winterbourne View uh, unit in Bristol. Uh, and this is precisely what happened there. Um, these were young people with um, quite severe learning disabilities who had uh, were admitted to this unit uh, because they they hadn't managed in 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 other types of accommodation, uh, who were systematically abused by a group of uh, uh, non qualified staff, whilst qualified staff looked on and did nothing. Um, and um, one of the ways that that was allowed to happen was that relatives were not allowed to visit patients where they lived. There were visitors' rooms where they could uh, they, they could meet with them, but they weren't allowed actually onto the unit in order to sort of visit bedrooms, sit in living rooms, and just be part of what was going on in the, in the community there. And this is the way that uh, um, poor standards of care can be promoted because if you haven't got that kind of um, almost sort of institutional vigilance that uh, uh, a free and open visiting policy allows, then um, you can be on very dangerous ground um, with a sort of incremental um, sort of permissive um, attitude of, 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 of abuse in a unit in a unit like that um there is a there was a horizon documentary made about it which is i think available on the university it's called the university's box of broadcast system uh system but so i am um, i would encourage you to go and have a look at that
Um, somebody's pointed out that families are, uh, um, can be abusers too. Um, that's true. But um, again, I, I want to restate that having a, f a free and open um, visiting pol policy, um, particularly where a healthcare unit becomes somebody's home, is a really important way of making sure that standards are kept high. Um, it turns into a sort of self-monitoring situation, really. Signs and symptoms of this type of abuse, low mood, anxiety, again, uh, poor self-esteem, as with the last category, um, but also a lack of self-care or self-respect. Um, if you make somebody feel that they're worthless, then, then that's the way that they'll behave towards themselves. Um, neglect as a form of abuse uh, can be both done um, purposefully, but also just because uh, uh, there's a lack of understanding of what patients need. Um, and I think this, if we go back to those categories of abuser, this is often the situation that you can have with those first two categories of people who are just overwhelmed um, by having to care uh, for somebody with complex needs because of problems that they have for themselves or advanced age or whatever. Um, this type of abuse could be, uh, could lead to poor nutrition, a failure to provide a warm, safe and comfortable environment, not providing aids to support patients like walking sticks, walking frames, grab rails and so on, failure to prevent physical harm, but also just poor standards of care, not reading ca uh, patients' care plans, and not also not being aware of um, evidence-based practice and the best way of caring for, caring for people. Uh, somebody's saying that they've worked in a hospital that operated no visitors in rooms policy, and is that okay to do? Um, I think unless there's an evidence-based reason for doing that because of the particular environment that you're working in, and I mean really strongly evidence-based, um, then no, it's not okay to do. I think usually with things like that, it's done for the convenience of the workers uh, and not for the well-being of uh, um, the, 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 the patients. So I think you're on very dodgy ground if you're introducing policies like that. But as I, I say, it's not inconceivable. There might be specific reasons for this happening. Oh, uh, somebody's just pointing out it wasn't Horizon that did the uh, documentary on Winterbourne View. It was Panorama. Um, most of it's all, if, if it's not in the uh, box of broadcasts that, um, uh, on the electronic library, then it is certainly available on, um, in sort of little episodes on YouTube. Um, signs and symptoms of neglect then, uh, patients appearing dishevelled, looking as if they've been neglected in ter terms of their care needs, poor nutrition, poor hydration, poor hygiene, loss of mobility and pressure sores. These are all classic signs of, of neglect. They should also though include all the signs and symptoms of institutionalisation. Um, institutions with the best will in the world have a dehumanizing effect on people. Um, we tend to take, uh, if we're not very careful, a one size fits all attitude towards people that, uh, for whom an institution has become their home. And it's only by constant vigilance that we kind of guard against this. Uh, uh, more than that though, I think, a, a combination of constant vigilance and sort of creative thinking really, focusing on the individual uh, um, and um, their individuality if you like 
So we'll move on to physical abuse. Um, this can involve uh, obviously being hit, kicked, slapped, punched, um, burning, pulling hair, biting, pinching, uh, but also uh, some, some crossover here with um, uh, neglect, the denial of food and water, um, creating unsafe environments, uh, the overuse of medication, the misuse of alcohol and sleep deprivation. The overuse of uh, medication is an interesting one. There's been a lot of uh, um, material in the in in the in the media. Um, it was a it was a while ago now, but uh, um, about the overuse of antipsychotic medication uh, in people with Alzheimer's uh, or forms of dementia. Anyway, now people with um, dementias, and particularly with with a form of dementia called Lewy body dementia do experience psychotic type symptoms they're often quite deluded and and hallucinated so um antipsychotic medication can have a role the concern was that it was actually being used as a kind of chemical kosh really to manage people's behavior rather than their symptoms um, and that was a good example of, of this type of abuse um, so signs of physical abuse can involve uh, can include bruising and injury to the body um, bite marks drowsiness due to over medication or indeed the reemergence of symptoms due to um under medication Uh, people are pointing out that they've seen situations where aggressive dementia patients are over medicated. Um, also, the individuals can fall into more than one of these abuse categories, and there's huge crossover between them. I think that's right. I think the only way to combat it is by being vigilant, trying to think about some of this material, and particularly the signs and symptoms of abuse. Um, and someone's also talking about um, changes in budget, reduction of money for care in the community. I mean, that can be a self-defeating policy because it means that people are they're more likely to be admitted. And um, with Winterbourne View, I think it was the um, return to institutionalization to an extent that uh, caused a situation like that to arise uh, but it actually that was also more due to very poor um, uh, monitoring of private contracts for that kind of that kind of care um, sexual abuse uh, any person forcing a patient to have sexual intercourse or perform unwanted sexual acts or the converse of that is denying uh, somebody the right of a sexual partner where they have an ability to consent. Um, this is extremely difficult in institutions. Um, and I don't think there are any easy answers, really. Um, what we have to be careful about is that um, we don't deny people the right to um, have a relationship because of our own um, uh, morality and our own... Um, uh, distorted morality um, really I'd be interested to see what people think about that I think um, someone's raised a very good point here. They're saying that, that nurses can't always make decisions on their own. Well, they, uh, I, I think that's right. Um, when you have concerns about a vulnerable adult, and we're going to cover this in a minute, you should always take recourse to supervision. Um, the position you're in as a student, that means supervision with senior members of staff, but also with university staff as well. And I think that's quite a good way of triangulating your concerns if you, if, if you have, have them. Oops. Um, 
spelling mistake at the top there, signs and symptoms of sexual abuse. Um, a bit, bit unpleasant, really, but genital bruising, bleeding or infection. Inappropriate or over-sexualised behaviour on the part of the victim. A preoccupation with personal hygiene and withdrawn or depressed uh, or uh, behavioural low self-esteem, which is a common theme, isn't it, throughout all of these. Um, there's no doubt that abuse of vulnerable adults is underreported, um, particularly sexual abuse, uh, often um, because people find it such a difficult area to think about, then it's easier just to turn a blind eye. And uh, an anal analysis carried out by Action on Elder Abuse found that only 3% were related to sexual abuse. Now, that's too low. Um, so that was felt to be clearly due to um, under-reporting. Institutional abuse. Uh, this is a type of abuse that, that, that can be a product of lots and lots of poor care decisions, really. Lots of episodes of substandard care. Um, it, it tends to happen when re institutions are rigid and inf inflexible and lose sight of the individual, really, and start treating people as, um, as objects or problems to be solved. Um, it also occurs when nursing care is not underpinned by current evidence or guided by professional standards. People aren't keeping standards in mind. They're not trying to link the nursing care they're offering to basic principles. If you can't link what you're doing back to some basic principles that tell you why you're doing it, then you really need to question why you're doing it. Um, signs and symptoms of uh, institutional abuse are high incidence of pressure sores, poorly managed incontinence, and th this is only a, a, a tiny list. You could come up with a much longer list than this if you wanted to. Patients becoming malnourished, dehydration, and people appearing um, de generally dishevelled and unkempt. So let's have a think about your responsibility to report abuse. If you receive information that indicates uh, or alleges in abu uh, uh, abuse or in inappropriate care of a vulnerable adult, then you need to act and act quickly. If it's ongoing and you think the person is at immediate risk, then it should be immediate. Now, the first step to take is referral to a line manager. And that's, you know, in your position as a student, that might well be your mentor or, or if your mentor is not available, then um, the unit manager or, uh, or any senior member of staff. Um, but I think that, um, well, I don't think, I know that you must also uh, share the information with the university. Now, that could either be with your tutor or uh, what's called the placement development lead for your placement. Um, for instance, currently I'm the placement development lead for Devon Partnership Trust, so I'm somebody that could be approached about that in, in, the, in that area. If you're unsure who to contact at the university, then just get hold of somebody and they'll tell you the right person to go to. Um, if your uh, difficult situations are where your line manager or some other member of staff that you might have reported the abuse to um, is potentially an abuser, and then I think that that means there's added importance um, to uh, reporting abuse to the university but also you shouldn't be afraid to go to the next level of seniority within your placement if that's practicable. Incidents involving criminal abuse must be reported immediately to the police.
um, somebody's pointing out that what can happen is that um, uh, allegations can be untrue. Well, the only way of finding that out is through an investigation. Um, so reporting still remains in, uh, uh, important, even if uh, um, there, are, there might be reasons to think that the, the allegations are untrue. Um, I think uh, if you think that there's uh, an abusive situation within a practice placement, then you should always tell both your mentor and the university. But um, you make a good point uh, in terms of confidentiality, because you have to be um, uh, careful in these situations. You, you shouldn't just anecdotally discuss things with people. If you're not sure, then I think it helps uh, to discuss things informally with a senior impartial member of staff or your tutor and you can do this on a no names and uh, uh, um, no location basis if you prefer. Again if it is your mentor that, that, you're, that you're concerned about then you need to um, go to the next uh, level of uh, seniority from, from your mentor or find somebody who you, you, you think is, is impartial. Um, in very exceptional circumstances then where you think that abuse is happening, you can pass on information without the individual's permission. Um, and the, the standard to set really is if you think there's risk of significant harm uh, and you know that you're acting in somebody's best interests. The agencies involved in self, self, safeguarding are the police, the local authority, multi-agency public protection, housing agencies, health and probation. Um, finally, if you witness or suspect that there is a risk of immediate harm to a person in your care, you should report your concerns to the appropriate personal authority immediately. You must act straight away to protect their safety. Now, I think we're going to finish in a moment um, to give you time to get on to the biology webinar. I apologise again for my um, the confusion I caused at the beginning of this. I hope not too many people have missed it. I will do it again anyway to catch up uh, uh, people that, uh, um, that missed it because of my um, getting the times, you know, having two different times. Um, this is a good link to the local Devon Safeguarding uh, website. Recommend you have a look at that. Tremendously good resources on there and that should answer lots of your questions of things I've left unanswered um, from this presentation. Also a long list of re references, um, uh, not all on the um, Aspire reading list, but um, and they won't all be in the library either, but um, uh, lots of them are available uh, uh, on the internet because they're policy documents. So have a look at those as well. Thanks ever so much for listening today. And um, I think we'll finish there for now. I'll just have a quick last look at, um, at questions. Uh, just to re-emphasize the PowerPoint, the extra slides will be available. and. Um, I will upload this presentation as soon as I possibly can. Um, and I'll leave you to go to your biology webinar with Andy Evenden. Uh, thank you.